Hello everybody, welcome to the Scottish Rugby Podcast brought to you by the Scottish Rugby Blog. I am Cammy Black. Um, joining me this evening, we've got um, a packed podcast as always. We've got Ian Hay. Good evening, Ian. Hello. It also sounds like we were joined by a pack of crisps at the start. <laughs> I think that was John Anderson adjusting his mic. It was, yeah. It wasn't. Or the, a uh... bag of Roysters. Uh, it's actually wheat crunchies I'm into just now, but uh, yeah, Ooh, I love a wheat crunch. What flavour oh, though? It's the smoky bacon ones, man. Oh, oh yeah. You were just testing Dino. these on the way to uh, Portobello. We were, like, yes, that, that put it in my head. Tomato and Worcester sauce. Was that the flavours? That was other flavours. I like the tomato ones. Did yeah. they do a salt and vinegar as well, or am I just making that up? He must. I, I think that's. I mean, must be made up because we wouldn't. They can't, I don't think he would do a wheat, a salt uh, and vinegar wheat crunchies. No. They should have. It's they just mad have. enough to work. No, I don't think it would do. No, I, I think that you need more savoury flavour. Salt and vinegar is a bit more of a sweeter flavour. You need some more kind of earthy sweet. for wheat crunchies. No. I always do like a bit more. I reckon, I reckon I just, those, they, did I, they not replace one with somebody? Google this for us, right? Anyway, hi, well, Craig. You right. <laughs> guys introduce yourself. Craig Manson's here as well. Craig, what's your views on wheat crunchies? Wheat crunchies, I, I did like them. Um, I think there was a salt and vinegar going up, I say, but uh, I'm more of a nice and spicy knick knack guy. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what? Wheat coffee. crunchies don't have a wiki page. What? How am I meant to get my information otherwise? Just Google wheat crunchies. That's what I've done. I expected I'll. Like a wiki page to come up and tell me about the history of wheat crunchies and tell me well, all the they, flavors and when they well, were. Who makes, well, are they walkers or KP or does KP even exist anymore? I don't know. Ah, do you know I this is know. the kind of scintillating chat you get on this uh, <laughs> podcast, is it? <laughs> Crisp chat with. <laughs> Look, anyway, if you're watching us uh, live and enjoying the Crisp chat, you, you'd be watching us live on Facebook, uh, YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch. Um, we also have put the podcast out in audio format on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, um, Amazon Music, and anywhere else that you can get your podcasts. We have a Patreon as well, which is uh, patreon.com slash Scottish Rugby Podcast. And for £3 a month, you will get access to a bonus weekly podcast as well um, that we do at the end of the main one. Um, this week, that's likely to have most of the URC chat, so just a word of warning, because... During the, the TikTok Six Nations, that's what we're going to... Ian's shaking his head. You are. I'm going to make you talk about Glasgow. Um, um, <laughs> during... um, my Premier player wasn't working properly, so I've only seen highlights of both games. Oh, that's what John can tell, talk about. Yeah, John Johnny, can... Johnny tried that one last night on another pod as well. No, no. You can just batter in. Come on. <laughs> Get it yeah, watched. And, and, uh, and don't listen. You know, well, I always like you to listen to a, another <laughs> podcast, but... If you're an Edinburgh fan, um, we'll all just be having a word with John Anderson and Johnny McGinty with their um, absolute hilarity that we got ended up. We got sent uh, Henry Purgos along the road. <laughs> we'll, we'll, come to that, we'll come to that maybe later in the Patreon pod and settle that score. Um, like I said, the main thing we're going to do, though, during the TikTok Six Nations is the focus on every podcast is going to be on uh, the uh, Scotland women. Um, and how they're getting on um, and, and following those matches. Um, and if we have a chance to talk about anything else at the end of the main podcast, we will do. Most of the kind of URC stuff will probably fall into the Patreon-only pod. We will, though, Ian, we will have time later on to talk about Big Bob Harley. And rightly so. I think it's, it's um, the least he's due. Yeah. So we'll, we'll come We'll come on to uh, Scotland's great rugby philosopher at the end of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, Scotland, England at the weekend. Craig, we did a preview of this last week. And I think, you know, we, we said at the time, Scotland, you know, England are going to be probably too much for Scotland. Mm. Um, we had Rachel with us and we were talking about kind of what, what could Scotland, what could, should Scotland be aiming to get out of the match? And like she's, you know, winning those, you know, the, the little battles within the game. She wasn't yeah. as pessimistic as us. I think she said you go into every game hoping to win, and she's maybe yeah. right. But I don't. I feel like it felt to me, and I don't. Want, I don't want to compare. The, spend too much time comparing the Scotland women and the Scotland men. But in terms of the development, it felt very much like when Scotland lost fifty-one twenty-two to the All Blacks in twenty twelve, because I went out and celebrated that game because we scored three tries against the All Blacks 
And it was mm. a good Scotland performance against an, a very, very good All Blacks team. And this feel, this felt very similar, I think. Well, you, you have to, to to equate it for those who don't really follow women's rugby. And, and first of all, why aren't you? Uh, and, uh, you know, to be, if you look at the Black Ferns won the World Cup four years ago, um, three years ago, four years ago. And they came up to play England and the first game they lost 57 points to 15. Now, if you look at, no, sorry, 53 points to 15. If you look at where we are now, where Scotland are, they're doing, you know, not to, you know, um, uh, put a tweet like you did earlier on, Cami, last week about um, the Lions, etc., um, and Edinburgh. But if you look at um, how Scotland have played, they are they're 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 getting similar scores to the Black Ferns at this moment against England. So there's got to be positivity. You've got to look upon this as a positive situation. Um, they're they're almost getting to the the level of the, of the other teams. Um, uh, because England, we're never really going to get to England until we start paying um, and allowing uh, these athletes to perform and have no worries about um, jobs and this, that and the other. They can concentrate on just being very, very good rugby players. But, um, you know, not all's lost and I've got to say it was, an, it was a very, very encouraging and a very, very good performance against England on the weekend. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely something in, in you know what, what Craig says here. I mean, the other games England played <clears> recently, they, they beat Canada women 51-12 and they beat the USA women 89-0. Both those teams are higher than Scotland in the rankings at the moment. So for Scotland to put in that performance, the performance they did at the weekend, which is actually a very good performance when you look at the statistics, the scoreboard doesn't tell the whole story, I don't think. But... Mm. The, you know, Scotland are there, thereabouts with now in the mix with the other teams in at the top of women's rugby. Uh, if we if we are kind of treating England as a bit of an anomaly at the moment, yeah, if they're the the Harlem Globetrotters. Um, no, cause I remember two years ago I was actually supposed to go to uh, Scotland England game, but then it got moved because of snow to the day after. Um, and Scotland ended up getting nil. I think it was maybe like thirty nine, forty something nil. Um, but the thing is, England are just a cut above. You know, every time, you know, Scotland, you know, they almost sort of dominated the first maybe eight minutes. Mm. You know, they had a lot of possession. Um, they were making it, you know, just little bits over the gain line, but they looked very comfortable with the ball. Then as soon as England turned over, they were their lethal. Um, but you know, I think it was one of the better Scotland performances I've seen. Um, they didn't make as many handling errors as England did, I don't think, um, particularly not to begin with. Set piece looked solid. Um, it's just those, you know, you, know you, get, you get punished by the best when you make little mistakes. And there were little mistakes and they got punished by yeah. by the top side in the world. Yeah, John, I mean, you can, but you know, the conditioning of, of this, that Scotland team has vastly improved as well because the fact that they were still playing that game at full tempo at, you know, 83 minutes, still pushing to try and get a score and get points on the board, I think shows the, the, the I suppose that a return on some of the investment that there has been in this team, that they've been given the facilities and they're given the time to come together as a squad and train. Yeah, I, th- I think that's completely fair. I think when you so you've obviously touched on it right at the start to say that the the scoreline doesn't obviously do any justice to to this, and that is in part due to England, who, as we've all discussed, they are they are by far and away the best team in the world. the The stats, as you've said as well, the stats really do support Scotland. Were vastly improved to where even where they were last time out in the Six Nations, where they've been in the World Cup qualifying. The, these metrics, they'll be what the guys will be looking at and be taken away and being like, yeah, you know what, see if we can improve in these areas. You know, we've kept the best team in the world, you know, we've kept them honest, right? They could, they've done worse to a lot of other teams and I think Scotland were, were very strong. The big concern for me, just I've got the stats up here and I'm playing about with them as we talk and it's kind of played out in the stats actually. Missed tackles, 
again, you've got to expect mixed mix, mix tackles against a team of England's calibre, but to miss as many as Scotland did, you know, that's 21 missed tackles. You can't do that against anyone, especially not the best in the world because they will just destroy you. But as you say, fitness-wise, they kept going, they stuck in. There was lots of competition. They've made England made it, make a lot of tackles as well. So that's things to build on. Yeah. I mean, some of the stats, I want to come on to kind of what can change in a bit, but some of the more positive stats, Craig, I mean, Scotland had most time in possession, most territory, um, most time in the opposition 22, um, most possession in the opposition half. Um, it's, you know, they, they were kind of, when you look at the stats, it tells a very different story to the scoreline. Yeah, and I, I think um, for me, um, I looked at the visit, you know, I was, I looked at the visuals of it more than the stats, and 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 if you look at the 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 work the forwards did, and uh, the set piece was was almost almost um, they almost had parity with with England. Um, in fact, they put England under pressure a few times as well. Um, so for me, I think that that we've talked about it just a second ago about their ability to train together. I think also the amount of work that obviously. A good ninety percent of the team are now playing in the in the the, um, the Allianz Fifteens in the Premiership Fifteens, so they're, they're they're being exposed to um, higher levels of rugby, and a lot of the English uh, team are are their teammates. So I think that they've got that that, that no longer do England to them seem like the you know this juggernaut that's coming down towards them, and they've got to try and. And deal with it. They're actually on parity with them. It's just the little bits and pieces that are, are needing to start coming together if they have more and more time together. You know, putting the tackles in um, um, and and keeping the ball keep ball alive, as uh, as Roger would say. Yeah, I mean, I think again, watching it, it's that um, it's the thing the All Blacks used to talk about was redhead and bluehead. Actually, in attack, Scotland looked very calm and structured. Mm-hmm. It was more in yep. defence when. The panic set in a couple of times, and that's when England inevitably kind of capitalised it on and, and scored. Mm-hmm. And interestingly, you know, it kind of was coming from the more experienced players. And I don't know if there's just kind of that kind of flashback to, oh, here we go again, kind of thing that you, that you would get from having been on the end of beatings. Whereas some of the newer players were, were kind of came in and really hit the ground running. Yeah, well, the, the, the big thing again, it's this whole thing of um, it's. Um, we talk about um, generations learning from other generations. The, the good thing about the young players coming in is that, that, that they only know if they if they come through the system and then they go and play for Harlequins or they go and play for Bristol or DMP Sharks or wherever, or Loughborough, Edinburgh Uni is incredibly, incredibly highly thought of as well. They're being exposed to it straight away. They don't have to think about the old days of of. of of the you know playing in the prem the, the, the prem which which is a good level of rugby but when if you went from the premiership in Scotland um playing playing each weekend in and out and then all of a sudden you go in you're on pull on a Scotland shirt and you're then playing against you know a professional England team who are coming right at you you're obviously going to it's a big jump so I think the younger it's it's almost like the younger generation don't ha- have never experienced it, so they don't worry about it. It's just something that they just click into. Right here we go, and and they actually did just say they look very very good, and I, and it's a lot. There's been a lot on there's a there's very much there's a lot on social media. Probably 70 percent is positive. There's a lot of people saying, well, they still got beat 57, 57 five. You have to understand. How much growth there has been, and and how much they are looking, you know, a far better team. Yeah, because Ian, the, the stuff that went wrong was fixable, or, or seems fixable. It's just you know people standing in the wrong place, not guarding rucks. It's you know, no one to go and tackle. Like you know, with, I think Ronald Lloyd went high and got easily handed off for one of the England breakaway tries. These these are all just matters of tweaking and technique. There's nothing here that's. England are obviously superb, but the, 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 it's all fixable and sortable within the space of the tournament. 
Yeah, but we say that about the men's team as well, don't we? Um, <laughs> you know, it is, that's that's what separates the the great from the good is making those right decisions at those split, you know, those split second decisions, making the right ones. Um, and it's about staying cool and you know keeping shape. You know, a lot of time um, when I've watched the game back today, you know, it's the Scotland defence. Some players were completely darting out or uh, Nick Griggs in it. As I like to refer to it, that's from the one. Um, and it wasn't even dog leg, and it was like, you know, like an upside down McDonald's sign, is what it was, was what the defensive line was doing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they, they are all fixable, but it's actually fixing it, it's a hard thing. Because um, I've noticed, well, like, Italy seem to be our bogey team, you know, a lot of time when I've noticed against Wales and Ireland, seem to defend quite well. Maybe it's because they've got a more like their male counterparts, slightly more stodgy game plan. Um, then Italy come to town and they start throwing the ball all over the place. Uh, mm. You know, the Italian women's team are, are very entertaining to watch, and they cut a lot of like you know inside uh, pot passes up, run, cutting on the angles. Um, and I remember last time Scotland played Italy, Brian Easton wasn't happy with the way they defended. So yes, they are fixable, but <laughs> fixing it is a uh, it's quite a separate matter. Let's hope they damn well do. And now they get more time together, I'm sure it will improve. Yeah, and that's the thing, John. I think the difference, though, is with the men's team is whilst it's fixable, there's a question of whether anybody within the camp wants to fix it or go their own way and do their own <laughs> thing, even during go games. for a couple of jobs. <laughs> yeah. With, with the, that wasn't, that's not an issue for the Scotland women's team because... Everybody, ev- there, there is everyone knows the role and the stick to the role. No one's trying to force things. No one's trying to do, um, win the game themselves. There wasn't a great deal of. You would have thought with that scoreline and the way the game was going, there would be a lot more frustration on sh- show, yeah. particularly from maybe the players that maybe have have faith in their own ability. But there wasn't a kind of, the, the, particularly in the attack, that everybody did their job. Yeah, you can see they're all really bought into to the message. You know, they, they're all about that development. It's about, you know, the messages coming out of camp are we need to put in, I think it was Tyrone Holmes was on the, the press before the game, saying, you know, we're just looking for f- five good performances, five solid performances where we've competed. They, they're they not being unrealistic. They're not believing. And that that's the sign of a really, really good sports person. To be to know your know where you're at and know and want to strive to improve, strive to be better, but knowing where you are as a collective and buying into improving that. And the men could learn a shed load from the mentality. The 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 women's team have improved significantly over the last few years. They've they've had milestones, they've had landmark victories. Against the odds, let's be honest, like they're still competing with two hands and a leg tied behind their back. And yet they're making these big wins, they're competing, they're making teams like England have to beat them as opposed to just turn up and beat them. And that's what's important. And you can see they all believe in that and they're all striving to be better. And that, you know, that's that's a mentality thing. You can't teach that. And that's, that's amazing. There is something in that, Craig. I don't want, you know... It, Playing for the love of the game and what it does to you, as opposed to you know, because they don't. None. Of, I'm not. You know, absolutely, they should be paid and supported with what they deserve. But I think there is an element of that. It doesn't make you take it for granted. Do you know what I mean? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. And and you know, we are at this point of we have these, uh, we have these. Athletes that are right on the cusp of of, of going from um, amateurs to professionals. Um, I'll tell you one thing: um, uh, if any of our listeners should seek out and watch "No Woman, No Try," um, mm-hmm. the documentary that's just come out on 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 Prime, um, it it explains quite a lot of what I've seen um, and and how women are treated within the game and. Even just down to small, small. It's not small things. It's it's actually a massive thing. But it's it's getting kit right and stuff like that. But all of the, all of those experiences and all of these um, 
all of the uh, and please, uh, I, I'm an old white man, so you know, please don't. Uh, you know, I'm just I'm just trying to put across my point, but the experiences that that all women have playing rugby, whether it's amateur for it's from for a local team, whether it's for a professional team or for 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 a national team. It seems to bind them together, and and all the you know Scotland women at this moment in time are on a march forward, and they've not got a time or to to be distracted by, you know, hey look at me, I'm the best player over here, and I'm going to be, I want to be your captain, and I'm going to do the best, I'm going to score all the tries, and look at me, they don't have time for that because they've got to get ready for the World Cup, they've got to get, um, they've got to push on, um, and and they have more and more things to strive to be. To, to be better, um, there's too many in in the, too many people within the men's game who believe are believing their own hype, who believe they are the best player within their squad because they have that comfort they can do that. Um, whereas with with within the women's game, they're always told that they're not good enough. They're always told that they're not that you know um, that they always have to strive to be part of the club. Um, or they have been up until the last few years and are still working hard. So I guess it, that's a really long answer. Again, I'll do it all the time, but it's it, it's 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 driving women's rugby forward, and I think it's 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 it, it's a state of mind. And the, and and Scotland's rugby are, are showing, or Scotland women's rugby are showing that they are pushing forward. So they don't have time for any other the other the other crap that comes along. Yeah, I don't because know what you could possibly mean, Craig. Well, you know, and speaking, of, speaking of Stuart Hogg, um, he, uh, <laughs> but he knows the thing is, though, Ian, he knows where his next game, Scotland game, is coming from. What, regardless of whatever Gregor Townsend does, uh, Stuart Hogg sitting there, knowing, bar an injury, he's going to get be Scotland's most capped player. He's going to get the most tries because he will know now, at his age, how many more games he's got in a Scotland shirt between now and when he retires because. He got Six Nations, a Summer Tour, and Autumn Tests. The fact that we were talking, and this is what we talked about last week on the podcast, women don't often know when their next game of international rugby is coming. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? That's, because there's no Autumn Tests. There's no Summer Tour. There's no, you know, you've got the Six Nations, and then, well, let's just see what happens after that. Yeah, true. And also a lot of time they don't know what position they're going to be playing in <laughs> um, or if they can get time off work. Um, mm. so one thing, because you look at uh, Christ, Christine Belisle, who's now, you know, who's now muscled her way into first choice tighthead. I'm pretty sure she's played at centre and blindside flanker before for Carter. I think a mm. uh, friend, uh, Rona Sweeten, has told me before. Um, but the, I mean, they are starting to look like a settled fifteen. But like you mm. said, you know, there is only the fixture list up to a certain degree, and then even, you know, in the in the pandemic times, uh, whereas the men had all the bubbles and security, all sorted out and arranged for them, the women didn't. So that that got their tournament pretty much scrapped. Did Scotland play any games at all in that Six Nation? Did, was there one or two, and then it got one or two, then it got scrapped. Yeah. <clears throat> um. So it's about time we got some parity there and a proper organise. I mean, it's like um, I suppose there are. It's, it's almost like cricket um, there's not that many nations who you could get a, a decent competition with uh, but you know it's up to world rugby to expand it and uh, I mean you know, we know it's kicked on plenty here and in other countries so there's no reason why it can't and in certain other areas where rugby is maybe a sort of secondary sport you know I mean look at what Scotland did to South Africa women's team a couple of years ago decimated mm-hmm. them mm-hmm. and South Africa are or, you know, a nation of the four champions for God's sake in the men's game, um, at fifteens and sevens. Yeah, the um, I, I think it's worth as well. You know, we talk about being a settled fifteen, John, but there was some really good, phenomenal performances from the bench as well. I mean, Shona Campbell. I mean that that the, the the hit that hit. Oh, <laughs> oh. oh that's, that's just. That's, that's just an impression of what what happened. Was it uh, Helen Rollins? Was that her name? Yeah. That took... mm-hmm. Oh, oh, that take the wind right out of you. Lined her up, went like an arrow. And and that and that's the thing. Like 
being able to do that is is a sign, you know, obviously you want your bench coming on and wanting to make an impact and wanting to be part of this team, but also just having that bit of quality to be able to, you know, that it was, it was a phenomenal hit and being able to line someone up like that in the modern game where, you know, people are jinking about all over the place. You know, I, I can't wait to play next weekend and get absolutely sidestepped right, left and centre. So, um, <laughs> You know, it's it's much hard. It's much harder to you know even with people going big, big and direct. It is much harder to make those dominant hits and to yeah to see that sort of impact off the bench is great. And you want that that settled fifteen. You want them to kind of be setting the standard, and everyone else is desperate to be part of that team. And you can see that everyone's wanting to make an impression and wants to play for that play for our country. So that is brilliant. I think I think also you know Shona Campbell, Leva Donaldson. Uh, and and Merrill Smith, who they all they all come from a really good setup within Edinburgh Uni, um, and you know Edinburgh Uni have produced quite a, a fair few Scotland players, and um, you know they they know um, they know the levels they need to be at, um, and they are you know to the point I think Rachel said last week, you know there's a lot of people now choose to go to Edinburgh Uni because. They know that they're going to get a high level of rugby as well as they're going to be able to study and do whatever they're doing, whether it's whether it's veterinary surgery or whatever. But um, so it's 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 good to have a good setup there. We just need some we need some more setups at that level as well to provide a, a bigger player pool. You know. Yeah, if there's only one place, it's it, 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 whilst that's brilliant to have that, and that's the start. As you say, you know, you want to be driving that and getting more and more places really de- delivering high quality. Uh, of rugby because yeah you can see the difference it makes and it's not to say we go down the route of having the kind of private school style of things but these universities can provide a great platform for people to play lots of competitive rugby i think it's also just taking you you know players want to take the chance shona campbell's a really good example of that not, not only with that hit but just the way that she ran with the ball and, and 50 56 got... meters gained uh third third highest carrier for scotland in 27 minutes yeah it was yeah. it was mish-esque the way yes. <laughs> <laughs> but even like i said meryl smith it was meryl smith came, came on as well, two minutes but she was really involved in that last kind of passage of play where scotland were putting a lot of pressure on england and there's down as one tackle made but i think it was a pretty big hit that she made. I think she might have even got made the hit that got the turnover and put Scotland back in possession. So for someone, Craig, I guess, to at this level to step up and slot in with the pace, I know it was the end of the game, but it was still being played at a ferocious pace to be able to kind of just hit the ground running like that is, is, is a really good kind of mark of where Scotland are in terms of, and I know you get frightened of depth, Craig, but but you know... <laughs> I've not got my chunks on. I've not got my chunks on. <laughs> well, but, but it's, you know, the women's team are building that depth. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think I think it's uh, it, it's obvious the the way that they're training. They're obviously getting far more time together. They're built that they're able to. You know, it, it's all to no matter what anyone says. It's all to do with time together because you then have those those players know what's expected, um, and so they're not being brought off the bench as a as someone who wasn't good enough to start, they're being brought off the bench to do a job. Um, and I think if we, they, they get more and more parity that way because they've got more and more depth, then we're, we're going to see a stronger squad going further down the line to the World Cup. Next weekend's going to be interesting. Wales away. And Wales obviously beat Ireland at the weekend, which has been hailed in Wales, as all Welsh victories are, as being the greatest thing <laughs> since 1973 or whatever, whenever the last, you know, Lions. Bridgen beat the All Blacks in 1968. Um, but it is, you know, Wales are on the up as much as Scotland are. It's going to be a close game, Craig. Yes, it is, and and this is you know um, I don't think we're scared of Ireland, but and I, I don't think we're scared of, of Wales, but Wales have got a lot to prove, and they've got a lot of pressure on their backs from from the performance of the men's team, and they're looking to provide a um, a little bit of evidence of where the the, the you know them being uh, you know the, where the funding's going, but also the fact that the, the, they've got. Welsh national pride on their back, so they're going to be a dangerous team 
to play against. Um, and they've got some phenomenal players as well. Uh, so again, I'm going to say this. I don't. I can't believe I'm actually going to say it, but I'm going to say it this time. Um, I said it earlier on about the men's team uh, uh, earlier on before the Six Nations started, but this is where we really need to see where Scotland are going to be. They need to perform now. Um, and and if, if, if we're going to hail them and tell them that, that, that and believe them when they say that they've got parity against England in certain things um, and we feel that they're at a certain level, they now need to be putting Wales away, away, um, and also taking Ireland down having a good go at Italy and then seeing how we get on with France at home. It really will be interesting. Yeah. You looking forward to a good game this weekend, John? Yeah, definitely. Actually, I think it's going to be another, uh, I think it's going to be another really exciting game, actually. Um, just again, the way, the way the teams play, Wales may be a bit more pragmatic, but I think there's, I think there's, there's points to be scored. And I think both teams have got really exciting players who can, yeah, just cause cause a wee bit of mayhem. Uh, Wales were pretty poor defensively at the weekend, despite winning. So Scotland shouldn't. Again, it's that thing of you've got nothing to fear. As you say, Wales have taken this victory as as this is women's rugby has arrived in Wales, and therefore we are the greatest in the world at it. Um, it's not quite as much as that, but it was a great win for them. Um, but then we need to remember we beat Ireland recently as well. So yeah. you know, Scotland, well, beat, Scotland women have beaten Ireland away. So yeah, mm-hmm. so we, yeah. we should be going down there expecting it to be competitive. It'll be a tough Twice. game, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Twice. Drop that in um, um, without any professionals. <laughs> well, I think that's the... nice to see. It's really kicking off the uh, you know cementing our place in the the uh, rankings of the, the Twitter wars. I was I was talking to Carwin. Me and Johnny were talking to Carwin about this last night, and actually he was giving it the big licks about the women's team. And uh, yeah, we basically like absolutely destroyed them. So it was good fun. I think what's going to be interesting to talk about professionals. I mean, is the next couple of years to see which Scotland Wales have got divergent models of how they're going to fund women's rugby, and we've got more details now. The Scotland model. So I suppose the Scotland model is kind of this hybrid, we're going to do what we need to do because some people have got full-time jobs but still want to play rugby and we've got people who aspire to play rugby professionally and we need to support them in doing that. And presumably, and it sounds like there is some sort of long-term plan to move towards a fully professional model, whereas Wales have just gone bang, 13 pro contracts, on you go. So it's it'll be interesting to see whether or not that the Scotland hybrid model works in terms of transitioning people to a slow, more slower transition to professional rugby or whether the Welsh let's just throw some money at it and hope it works. <laughs> but you know how, how that pans out. Yeah, I suppose it's all the nuances, isn't it? Um, Cause we know that, I mean, as it was in the, in the beginnings of the men's game, uh, some people had careers that it probably wasn't financially beneficial for them to move over. Um, we know, for example, Hannah Smith's got a pretty decent job as a vet. Um, if, I mean, how, how much are the Wales? How much are the Welsh Rugby Union paying per player? Do we know? I don't think that's been released. No, it um, hasn't. It hasn't. I don't know. It won't. No. I'll, I'd, I'd, I'd heard somewhere around the twenty-two thousand, but I'm not entirely sure if that's uh, that's right. I wouldn't take it as gospel. <laughs> Is that uh, Wheels Online or uh, someone else on top? <laughs> um, no, it's, uh, it, it depends on how successful it goes, I suppose, whether it's, it seems like, I think it is a good idea to to maybe sort of tailor make it just as long as it's, it's fair uh, Then you I have to allow for certain things. It's complicated. That's all. Yeah, saying. I, I, I think it's. Bit. You know, I keep I keep bumping my gums about paying them the, the, what what they're due, but that's not going to solve the problem completely. Um, you know, we we need a we need a professional team, at least one professional team in Scotland, um, so that you know they can play together on a regular basis, and they can also, um, you know, they have they 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 train together so that they know what you know on week in week out, so that they know. If that player is playing beside them, 
how, how they move, how they how they take whether they're going to take a short ball or a long ball. It, it's it's we we really need the you know what's show, what's been shown by all of our players. Well, most of our players going to to the, the Allianz 15s is it, it's shown how much they grow when they're playing in a again in a professional sport and up against the people who are, who they're going to come up against in the international squads. So I think if we can if we can get go down that route of getting ourselves a team in Scotland, then at least we, that, that's going to play hopefully in the Allianz 15s or whatever, then we have the ability to then um, you know bring the team together more and more. You know. Nineteen grand a year the Wales women that are on, which right. is sho- shocking. That's shock- a disgustingly low amount of money. No, yeah. so- any the, 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 there's an there's something that I, mean, I think Rory threw this in at the end of the, your match report, Craig, um, about you know the SIU investment in Old Glory, and I think what the weekend showed is there's a massive audience for for women's rugby in Scotland because mm. it's four thousand attendance at the dam. Yeah. So you think well. You know, that's you could easily get that to along to pro rugby. Yeah, you know I mean, that's a decent that's a decent gate. I mean, you know, Glasgow and Ember have struggled to get gates like that back in the day. Yeah, they don't yeah. know. I'm not going to make an Ember joke because it's not it's not, it's not <laughs> relevant anymore. It doesn't happen. It doesn't, it doesn't happen anymore. It doesn't happen anymore. It just doesn't. Yeah. You said nineteen. Sorry, just to go back to your point there. You said nineteen grand. I think it was nineteen grand, I and it's seven grand on a retainer for I think the non-pro players. So nineteen grand is the equivalent of thirty-eight hours a week at minimum wage. Technically, thirty-eight point five hours a week at minimum wage. Yeah, they are being paid minimum wage to be mm. professional rugby players. Come on. What player? There's one of the players said um, one of the, the a fan wanted their boots at the end, and like, I'm sorry, I can't give you them. I don't. We don't all have boot deals. Yeah, like, <laughs> he's the only one market. we'll have all season. <laughs> yeah. I've been. Yeah. I bought these down Sports Direct. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, had to, I had to put the studs in them myself. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's a it's a regular thing, you know. I I remember having a discussion with 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 a Scotland player about boots, and and you know, all of our teammates saying, you know, we'll we'll help out. We'll you know we can get you because because they need three or four different pairs because yeah. of different surfaces, etc. And it's just it was it was actually just to going back to that that um, documentary that I watched um, the, the No Woman No Try, you know, it's amazing how much a, a correctly fitting pair of shorts does for a player. Um and and you know we've always gone down this route of oh they can have the men's stuff, you know or 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 for example I know for a fact that the the, the company that supplies our team, you know, they, you, if you want women's fit products, you have to buy 25 or 26 of them. Whereas if you want a, a men's pair of shorts, you can just phone them up and order or go online and order one pair. Yeah. And so it's, it's, it's a really, it's, it's changing the mindset rather than the actual, um, you know, as, as whales seem to be doing. And that is, there's your money. You've been asking for money. There's your money. Now go and perform. It's changing the actual whole mindset of making sure they've got the right kit, making sure they've got the, the, the you know, the, they've got the um, the right support, um, uh, bringing in sponsors that that are going to help them with different things. It, it, it's finding the right sponsors for that are going to actually help rather than just give money that will get absorbed into the into the um into the union and pay for something else you know so it's it's lots of different things that have to be changed the, john the interest- see with your spreadsheet see with your nineteen thousand quid how many uh how many welsh rugby play, women's welsh rugby players could jeff bezos pay for with his trips <laughs> to the planet of space seeing so- the documentaries on amazon how much is these trips into space cost no so far? No idea. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll work away on that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like we've got Stattle. <laughs> I know. <laughs> 5.5 5 billion he spent to be in space for four min- minutes. Oh, for goodness sake. He could, he could fund, I'm going to say, Ian, he could fund the entire of the top 10 of world rugby for a while. <laughs> <laughs> on living, on above the living wage. <laughs> 
<laughs> like, he's the only man who could possibly deal with the massive lawsuit that's coming World Rugby's way. <laughs> <laughs> so we so we try and get Jeff Bezos suddenly into rugby. Look, Jeff, you've got all these documentaries on you. Oh on Prime. My goodness. Yeah, that's not good, is it? You and Elon get together and make some kind of anti-concussion device <laughs> which all rugby players could wear. It's, just, it's uh, cra- crazy money, isn't it? And it's, it, you know, like we're joking about it, but the scale, rugby as a sport still, you know, obviously women's rugby, the funding available is so, so... Like, even compared to the men's game, it is pitiful. And then when you compare rugby to football the funding available is you know it's minuscule we we are talking about a a sport that has grown so much and is you know is so popular across the world but still has this tiny little monetary value and obviously investment partners are coming in to try and do their best with that but the one sport i think where the money is just mental compared to how popular it is is golf because you know you, you can win like 10 million dollars over the course of a weekend for winning one tournament yeah. and even even you can win you can win a million just for making the cut just being good not being a crap golfer yeah. you can make a decent amount of money <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just didn't hit it in the river you know because it's all <laughs> it's all rich white man sport well that's it and it's got the sponsor robots. it's got the sponsor so the sponsors will pay big money yeah yeah and also, they're on. They're on. Sure they're it's not that big of a TV draw. You think? No, nowhere near the likes so, of baseball. So Asia, Asia, Asia has a massive golf following, and so, so does. And you think you've got the whole of the United States as well? Yeah. This is a big. Well, you got a big golf audience. Yeah. To <laughs> answer your question guys. from earlier, Ian. Um, so, if you do five point five billion for four minutes in space, it could have done 289,184.5 Welsh all-time equivalents. <laughs> <laughs> At 38 and a half hours a week. <laughs> like I said, fund the entire top 10 of women's rugby. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Fund, fund, fund the entire rugby. top 10 nations. Of <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. It could be the Amazon World like Series. Every player in the world. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, almost 300,000 players could be funded by four minutes in space. God. There we go. That's your headline, folks. <laughs> yeah. I think that the coverage of the coverage was good. And I like the kind of we TikTok things that been out. I think it's it's been it's felt fresher the coverage, Craig, than the men's game. Yeah, um, it's it's a positive. Although you know, unfortunately, um, a lot of the pundits only really knew the names of and did the research yeah. into the Engl- England women. But they would word, um, would worded it. Yeah, they did. They, <laughs> they, they, they strategized and and um, and they analyzed and. Woodwarded it, and also, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's 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 one of those situations. I'm really excited by it. I think the buzz around the dam um, was was fantastic. I think that's a great new home for women's rugby in Scotland. Um, it's a great new home for for rugby in Scotland, uh, professional teams wise as well. Um, before John says anything, um, but uh, I, I think it's uh, I, I think it's. If we can continue and get, for example, a lot more free to air, um, uh, free to air uh, uh, games on, we're going to, try, you know, lots more people will actually get to watch it, and they'll put, you know, there'll be more exposure. If we get more exposure, we we'll get more money into the game. Um, and uh, but yeah, it's really quite exciting. It's it's a nice time. As we talked about last week, I mean, it was really nice to talk. Positively about rugby for a wee while, especially yeah. six nations. <laughs> it's great. You know, it's nice to sit here and talk about <laughs> what is a fifty-seven, you know, five loss and be like, "I oh, they played really well." That's nice. You know, yeah. than... <laughs> <laughs> Gives you a bit of faith back in rugby, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, Absolutely, if yeah. Bezos could buy them two hundred and eighty-nine thousand times over. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a slightly different podcast tonight, guys. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, how many? Uh, how many versions? How many Jean Paul Sartre books can uh, Jeff Bezos <laughs> buy Rob Harley with five point five billion? Uh, no first editions, or uh... I can't believe John's actually looking that up. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> <That's good>. <laughs> <laughs> right, so just, we take a lot. <laughs> so if we take the first one, which is existentialism, is a humanism. 
uh, which is the first result on uh, Jeff Bezos's site, which costs seven pounds twenty nine. I believe uh, that's also a Rob Harley's line out call. <laughs> <laughs> Some boy, uh, yeah. So, I a massive number like 75 million. All right, he buys a few fair copies of it for, for Bob. So, yeah, Rob Harley's Seven, leaving 754 Glasgow. million. And Rob if, you buy, if, you, if you buy that book on Amazon, you get a free ginger wig at the same time, <laughs> a free big bad Bob t shirt. <laughs> so, yeah, this is news Rob Harley's left Glasgow or leaving Glasgow, leaving Glasgow. Yes. He's not retiring though, John. He's nope. going somewhere. He says he's going to France. Does he? Is that the he latest? Says he, the latest is, he says, I would really like to go and try France. There is, I, there I is know a the lingo. So can you imagine? There is a match made in heaven. Oh, yes. Right? So Big Bob Harley and the D2. Big Bob Bob Harley, the D2. <laughs> Hoiking out eyes with his fingers. <laughs> Whilst learning Re- conversational French. And re- re- reading, reading philosophy in French. <laughs> Yeah, no, you know, he'd be sitting, sitting in the cafe, drinking his, his uh, eating his pan of chocolate, reading Jean Paul Sartre. Or likely nice sitting story, in the yeah. sin bin with an espresso. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think. I think to be fair, you're be, you're you're doing them a disservice there, Craig. With three uh, pan of chocolate, uh, just to be sure. <laughs> but uh, no, I, he's he, he suggested he knows the language from his time at school, and he's tried to keep up with it, which obviously plays into the rumours we've heard regarding his extracurricular activities where <laughs> reading French books on uh, away trips. So um, I think it will be a good move for him. I also think it's a... Mm, I'll save my true feelings for the for the, um, the Patreon, um, but I think it's a mistake and I'm not entirely thrilled about it. Would be a... a that's a teaser. It was a teaser for the Patreon bit. Mm. Yeah, but I mean, you know, he's he's been a stalwart of the this Glasgow side for a while now. Ian, is it maybe time for him and the club to? Uh, we'll come to John's views on this later. But how, how are you feeling about? It? Is it time, kind of a natural time to to break? Um, no, because I actually think over the last couple of years, he's he's sure he still has a lot to offer. I think, like, obviously the the championship years, shall we call them? Uh, when you know, for example, he scored the the opening try in that final. Um I think that season as well, every game he started, Glasgow won. Yep. Um right. and you know, he was he was at the peak of his game there. Then there was a couple of years where he dropped out of the team, then he came back. It was almost like a boxer moving up weight classes. You know, he came back <laughs> as as a lock. He was like, I'm I'm maybe not as fast as I used to be. That's it, I'm a lock now. I'm still handing the line out. Um and we, we know he's we know he's still a ferocious competitor. Um I remember there was a, a podcast, I think it was a Warriors one, where Graham Morrison was talking about some of the young guys coming through when, when he was sort of coming to the end of his career. One was Finn Russell, who was always dancing in the corner rather than doing his weight drills. <laughs> um, and one of the other ones was Rob Harley, and he said he, was, he said a story about uh, Dan Parks was just hoof these spiral kicks up in the air, and the players had to catch it one-handed. And only at that point, all these new boys, they had to catch it one-handed above their head. Um, and once you did that, that's it. You could hit the showers and go home. And Harley kept on missing it, kept on missing it, but he kept on going back for it. And eventually, at about like effort thirty-five, he got it. Um, I think Finn Russell probably cheated in his one somehow. <laughs> Is it the uh, Kobayashi Maru for Finn Russell? Yeah. <laughs> Sitting there with an apple. <laughs> Finn Tiberius Russell. Yeah, um, yeah. The test a cheat, you know, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, though, I mean. The, the one picture that sums up Rob Harley for me is that one with he's you know smiling with blood oh, pouring at his face just after beating Munster in the semi final fourteen fifteen. Um, yeah, like John, I don't, I don't. I think there's other people who could have been shipped on. I think, especially well, what, with what, 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 the position despite, he plays in. Um, despite the announcement today, and that was probably like if you're talking about age age ranges. Yes, Richie Grace had a very good season. And is very good in the line out and has had one probably his best season in a long time. But if you're talking cost versus age bracket bracket, you know, Richie Gray's injury prone moving into his thirty fourth year, you know, you could save a lot of dough shipping him. So you've got to wonder, is it Rob Harley's decision to move on? I I really don't think it would have been though. 
really don't no, think I'm pretty sure, I'm fairly sure he said it isn't. Um, I just think Danny Wilson's oh. made the, the decision for him. <sighs> Do you think um, Danny Wilson's just terrified of him? <laughs> <laughs> Danny Wilson does strike me. There's a person in my Who work terrified that, of? that just looks perpetually terrified, and it, she reminds me a lot of Danny Wilson. Like I so look what? at her and go, is that Danny Wilson? Uh, it just looks so scared at all times. Do you know why Rob Parley didn't get one of Scotland caps? Because Vern Cotter was shh, afraid of him. Vern Cotter, yeah. but even Vern Cotter was afraid of Rob Harley. It's probably because he uh, talked about death. The problem is we've no got um, we've, who we're going to bring into Scotland camp now unexpectedly, Craig, to beat up everybody in training <laughs> because that was the, that was his goal. That's, latterly, it was almost like Rob Harley's been added to the camp, and you go, someone's getting beaten right. up in training this week. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Rob's Rob's Rob Harley, the man who doesn't need a tackle shield um, or a ruck shield, he'll just take you on with his fists. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm quite glad to hear that um, that that he's 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 making the the journey to France rather than along the M8 because we've had enough of uh, Glasgow's rejects coming along the road. But uh, um, but yeah, we'll wait and see. It's. Uh, he's, I, I would like to say as an Edinburgh fan, um, but mainly as a Scotland fan, he's had a, a phenomenal career with Glasgow, and uh, he has to be um, thoroughly thanked. And I hope Glasgow makes sure that he gets a a good send off rather than. The, the the pretty I can't see it on the, uh, uh, until I go to the Patreon site. But lack, the, lack the, the, the lackluster um, Ross Ford's um, goodbye that um, happened with an Edinburgh. But uh, no, good on him if if he if he gets a chance to go to France and, and earn, earn a, a fantastic wage for a couple of years, and uh, uh, then good on him. He's he's performed incredibly well for Glasgow. You can have to learn to count backwards from five in French now, won't you? Every time the says use it. <laughs> Sang, maybe that's what, maybe Kappa, maybe Kappa, Kappa, Kappa. <laughs> Just is it sir or monsieur <laughs> the referee? Monsieur, monsieur. monsieur. <laughs> I don't know if anyone knows. If anyone's played rugby in France, tell please get in touch. Can you imagine? Like, I really think the French accent in Bob's voice is gonna be actually I think black holes are going to open and like the world is going to implode because that's going to be terrifying. Like in in a, in a world of confusion, Rob Parley speaking French at all times is going to be too much. He's going to be a god there. Oh, oh yeah, him and Sean, him and Sean Edwards can go to the the the, the pigeon French um, special special um, classes and come in and just you know. More. I hope, I hope, I hope him and Sean go for a coffee and talk about French philosophy. Absolutely, and just, you know, I'll, just I'll, in I'll French. I hope he joins the same team as Felix Lombie. <laughs> <laughs> and then they get sponsored a by a, a sponsored by Iron a Brew. manufacturer. <laughs> Je m'appelle Rob Uele Fishhook. <laughs> <laughs> Je m'appelle Rob, j'habite dans ta tête. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, yeah. So it'll be yeah. it'll be interesting to see how he does. Um, it's going to be really, you know, a lot of Glasgow fans have said it as well. It's going to be really surprising to see Bob in a different shirt. Um, and I think he's still got, you know, he's only 30, 31. He's still got a good few years left in him to. To really kind of, you know, he's about second row now, apparently. So you can go on to 37 quite easily. Um, I think he'll do great wherever he goes. And he's, he's, got, he's obviously fit. He's got the standards that he's set throughout his career. So fair play to him. Um, it'll be a massive loss for Glasgow. And, and we will come more to that in the Patreon. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of which, I think that's a, good, that's a good place as any to leave it this week. Um, like I said, we're going to, if you want a Patreon podcast, we'll, we'll talk about the URC games from the weekend. We'll talk a bit more about Big Bad Bob. Maybe we've got Richie Gray as well and some a couple of hands in the ruck as well. Um, like I said, if you want to sign up for that, it's patreon.com slash Scottish Rugby Podcast, £3 a month. Um, we'll be back next week. I won't be. I'm on holiday. Uh, John. Oh, that's right. I'm hosting next week, haven't I? You, you'll be in the daddy chair. I Craig was got upset when I put him in the daddy chair last week. He did, I wasn't, I, I wasn't really, upset. really upset. I wasn't upset. I was more terrified. <laughs> 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 what could possibly go wrong, Craig? Yeah. This is um, this know. is the last podcast in my thirties. <gasps> oh, oh. going to be forty on Sunday. So 
I don't know if I, I might still be drunk next by next Wednesday. <laughs> I don't know if I'll make the next podcast. Yeah, I'm not sure my liver will. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Yeah, we should just mention it, um, John. In a couple of weeks, you're playing um, in a charity game. You and Johnny McGinty. It's, not, it's yes. not even a couple couple of weeks. It turns out I had not done the sums, and it's Johnny. A week on Saturday. Reminded, yeah, 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 it's like nine days away. Um, so yeah, we're playing in a charity game nine days from now down in Southport uh, for Melanoma UK. Myself and Johnny will be travelling down to represent uh, the, the the Nick for, the Nick fifteen. Uh, in memory of a, a gentleman who passed away um, f- from from melanoma, various things. Um, it's going to be pretty crazy. There's quite a few of the... You know, it's nice because we've had a mention alongside some very esteemed podcast alumni uh, who, are, who are also playing. You know, you've got Lee from Blood and Mud, uh, Grav from Rock and Roll is now playing. Uh, we've got Will Owens from Squidge. Is uh, is playing as well, and obviously the you know the highlight is me and Johnny clearly, but um, yeah, it'll yeah. be really interesting. Sam Larner is going to be there, I think, as well. Sam Larner um, as well, yeah. Been on the plug before, um, so yeah, lots and lots of people um, who are going to be there for that. Um, if you, it's the Nick Giles fifteen RFC. If you can find it on Twitter, um, there's a um, there's a, there's a link. We've we've I've just tweeted it now with the the fundraising page for it. What yeah. they're trying to do, um, Gavin, who's in charge of that friend of the pod um is play two games back to back 600 miles apart so they've they got are, one in south they one in southport that john and johnny are playing in and then they're playing one at home uh their home venue down in hastings as well that's right yeah yeah and me and johnny are down from the for the north leg um we've been reliably told that they're going to have to set off at six in the morning on the sunday to get to the game so my choice of not staying at the club hotel is a smart one because then I'm not going to get woken up by them battering my door and causing carnage, probably some of which have not went to bed at that point. Uh, that would suggest I've went to bed at that point as well, but, you know, um, the stranger things have happened. So let's see. If I end yeah. up in a bus to Hastings, you know what's happened, guys. <laughs> I'm pleased. I'm, back. I'm pleased. This isn't this weekend. So there's someone to cover the podcast on Wednesday. Yeah, not, no, I'll, not I'll riding, be riding yeah. a mega bus back up to Glasgow <laughs> for Hastings. To then get one back down to pick up my car. <laughs> yeah. This podcast is just Craig and a premier in, <laughs> <laughs> and me turning up at the door going, "Craig, can I stay here tonight?" <laughs> totally, totally staring at the camera, going like, 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 uh, like, what's his name in Wayne's World? <laughs> Uh, slowly zooming in on you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on oh, that note, dear. yeah, that's it for this week. Like I said, probably back next week with John um, and uh, Craig and, and maybe Johnny as well, for, and, and possibly Ian if he's if he's recovered from his birthday uh, to look at the Scotland Wales uh, TikTok next Six Nations game. That's a mouthful. Um, <laughs> but for the moment, it's goodbye from me and goodbye from Ian, John, and Craig. Wow, cheerio, bye. Night, troops. <laughs>